Welcome to today's program titled Vaccine Policy for Employers and the Implications of the Federal Mandate. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box at the right-hand side of your screen. If you would like to stay on after the presentation, we can answer as many questions as we can. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required for the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of this webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, Tracy Billows. Tracy, please go ahead. Thank you so much. It is so wonderful to be with all of you today. I am thrilled to be presenting with my fellow partners as well as COVID-19 task force members, Kevin Young, Kristen McGurn, and Kobe Turner. You are um, in for a tremendous presentation today as we give you an overview of the most recent Biden mandates. Kevin Young, one of our preeminent lawyers dealing with regulatory issues and government agencies, including FLSA and others, and the DOL will also talk about OSHA um, and OSHA's enforcement uh, potentiality for the ETS. Kristen McGurn, one of our preeminent healthcare lawyers, um, will also be sharing what this policy mandates mean, um, how the EO applies to them, and all things that you need to consider going forward. And last, but certainly not least, Kobe Turner is going to be tackling the very complicated accommodations issue. One of the things that employers are just grappling with left and right in these situations as they navigate vaccine policies, mask policies, and any a number of different things. So with that, if we could turn to the next slide, please, Kate. So here's our agenda today, a brief overview of what uh, the vaccine mandates are, what they mean for different employers. Um, some legal challenges that we can expect to some of the mandates and how they may or may not play out. What are the policy considerations employers need to be undertaking right now? Whether you already have a policy in place mandating the vaccine, you're contemplating what that looks like. We're gonna give you a number of great tips and ideas as well as thoughts about what these um, executive orders and mandates are gonna mean for all of you. And then, as I said, last but not least, we're gonna talk about accommodation strategies as they relate to these policies and mandates. Next slide, please. So the vaccine mandates and what they mean at a high level. Next slide. So on September 9th, 2021, uh, the Biden administration announced what's uh, known as the COVID-19 Action Plan. Uh, there were six pillars in the plan and a number of different um, proclamations that was made with respect to um, executive orders, as well as what has been um, instructed of OSHA and other agencies with respect to vaccines. So you have a number of different executive orders. For example, um, you have federal workers um, and there is that mandate with respect to federal workers being fully vaccinated. Uh, we're not gonna be spending a lot of time on that particular mandate, but did wanna point out that that's there. There is then the federal contractor mandate, which is requiring certain federal contractors to have all of its employees um, ultimately be fully vaccinated. And there you're probably going, well, what does that mean, Tracy? What is all employees and what does fully vaccinated mean? And are there exceptions? We're gonna get into some of those thoughts in just a moment. And then of course, um, there's the OSHA ETS, which is gonna apply to employers with 100 or more employees and is gonna mandate the vaccine as well as uh, providing a testing alternative. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out also um, that in addition to all of these, uh, the CMS will also be required to take action to expand COVID-19 vaccination requirements to workers in healthcare settings that receive Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. 
This could include additional hospitals, dialysis facilities, ambulatory surgery settings, et cetera. So do know um, with all of these, we are expecting and waiting for further guidance. Um, we expect to see further regulatory um, actions and activities. And certainly we're gonna give you our best um, sort of understanding of everything as we have it today, but know this is gonna be continually evolving. Uh, so we kind of view today's webinar as the first in a series of many that we will be putting on as we get this additional guidance and information. Next slide, please. So just briefly an overview of the proposed OSHA ETS. This is gonna to apply to all employers with 100 or more employees. Um, the 100 or more employees is across the company. So it's not like FMLA where you look in a 75 mile radius of how many employees you have. We're talking about overall 100 employees. And the requirement that OSHA is, has been mandated to um, put into the ETS is that in all workers will be required to be fully vaccinated or undergo weekly COVID-19 testing. Um, you do, as an employer, always have the option, though, even under the ETS, to require vaccination, something we call the hard mandate, with no testing option. But do know that even under those circumstances, accommodations for religious and disability reasons will be necessary. Hence why Kobe's gonna walk you through a number of the different considerations. Um, as you see here, to give you a few more things, I see lots of questions coming in on this, some of which are answered by these next few bullet points, but 100 or more employees, as I said, are company-wide, not by worksite. Um, this does include seasonal employees. So for many of you who are gearing up for the holiday seasons, um, you know, this is going to be a big consideration as well. Um, this uh, one thing to point out is the emergency standard will not apply to employees that are called quote unquote fully remote. And fully remote is being defined as someone who's never coming into a work site or workplace. And when you think about it, that's kind of consistent with OSHA's sort of overall premise and purpose, meaning really OSHA is trying to protect people in the workplace. So if someone's never coming into a workplace or going into a client site, et cetera, it would make sense that this mandate would not apply. The mandate also is going to apply to employees who come into work even once though. So if you have those, what we call sometimes hybrid employees who come in maybe once a month or once every other week, this is going to apply. We expect that proof of vaccination will be met with um, at a minimum attestation. Doesn't mean that employers couldn't require more in terms of proof, such as copy of the vaccine card or something else. But given prior guidance from OSHA, we expect that an attestation will be sufficient. Um, the other interesting thing is um, employers will have to provide time off for the vaccination. So what um, OSHA will have to do is incorporate into the emergency standard a paid time off requirement. Next slide, please. So some considerations for federal contractors regarding whether the Biden administration vaccine is ultimately gonna apply to you. Um, this is, and you'll get this in the materials because I realize this may be hard to read depending on how you're looking at this on the screen, but this is really a key decision tree um, to help determine whether or not um, this is going to apply to your contracts. Because as I noted, not all federal contracts are going to fall under this mandate and the executive order, excuse me. Additionally, I want to also point out that to the extent you are covered under an existing contract, what that means is that you are not immediately gonna be subject to these requirements. Certainly the executive order suggests and encourages you to do so, but this is going to apply to all new contracts going forward as of October 15th as well as any contracts that get renewed October 15th or later. Um, there is guidance in the executive order that says from now until October 15th, the preference would be that these clauses and provisions requiring the mandatory vaccine be included, but no, ultimately the main date for all of you to be aware of is that October 15th date. Um, 
<clears throat> in terms of sort of doing this analysis, it's not an easy analysis. We are lucky at SciFAR to have our government contracts group, our people analytics group who help clients every day work through what does coverage mean? What is the threshold requirements? What do these different terms mean, um, et cetera? So we strongly encourage you to reach out to those individuals for further information on the applicability of this executive order. Next slide. With that, I'm now gonna turn this over to Kevin, who's gonna walk you through some expected legal challenges to all of these mandates, as well as how is this ultimately potentially gonna play out the ETS on a going forward basis. Kevin, it's all yours. Thanks, Tracy, and thank you all for being here today. It's an exciting and, and cutting edge topic. Obviously, it's one where we're continuing to learn a lot and, and will in the weeks and, and, and months to come. but. I wanted to focus my time today to, uh, on the ETS that's gotten a lot of fanfare over the last couple of weeks, a lot of attention, um, and will continue to do so. I want to talk a little bit about what to expect with the ETS, um, some open questions related to the ETS, and then, as Tracy mentioned, likely challenges. To, to, just as a starting point, I thought it makes sense to, to, to focus on, well, what is an ETS? And it, it, it bottom, it is a fast path to rulemaking that OSHA has at its disposal. It's not, not used very often. Traditional rulemaking at OSHA, like with most regulatory bodies, is done through notice and comment, which is just what it sounds like. Regulatory agency puts out notice of a proposed rule, invites comment on that proposed rule, reviews the comments, and then ultimately issues a final rule. That process can take a lot of time, particularly at OSHA. It's not known for being very quick with that sort of process and it results in what's intended to be a final or a lasting rule. On the other hand, there's what's referred to as, as, as an ETS, or an Emergency Temporary Standard, and it's really kind of the, the, the antithesis of, of, of traditional notice and comment rulemaking. It is quick, uh, it doesn't have to have notice and comment. What it allows OSHA to do is to put out a, a standard or a rule without notice and comment, and unlike you know, traditional rulemaking, the rule that results is temporary in nature, so it expires after 180 days. As you would imagine, OSHA can't just do this anytime it wants to. There's a pretty tight circumscription on when an ETS is appropriate. And what the statute allowing this provides is that OSHA can only do this when there's a, quote, grave danger uh, from exposure to employees working at a work site and where the standard that's promulgated, the standard that's issued, is necessary to protect employees from that danger. Usually, and one thing I'll add, usually when ETS comes out, at that point, OSHA will ask for comment. It'll say, hey, here's the ETS. We like comment on a potential final rule. So all of that uh, leads to the next question, you know, what's next in this process with this ex anticipated ETS? And with that, we'll go to the next slide. So uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so, so we don't know exactly when the ETS is going to be issued. On September 10th, an OSHA official uh, went down as saying uh, to expect something in the coming weeks. Uh, what exactly that, that means remains to be seen. I'd note that a healthcare ETS that was issued and, and promulgated earlier this year took about five or six months from when it was first announced till when it became effective. Um, certainly, I think most who have been listening know that President Biden and his administration are pushing for something as fast as possible here, but when exactly that will be, uh, remains to be seen. Um, once the rule is issued, once the ETS is issued, the rule will take effect immediately in 29 states where federal OSHA has jurisdiction. The mandates that are that are part of that ETS will be phased in. Uh, the healthcare ETS that, that focused on the healthcare industry that came out earlier this year phased in the requirements under that standard at 15 and 30 days. So maybe that's a what to expect here, but we just don't know yet. I'd note that, that the states where federal OSHA has jurisdiction include, but certainly aren't limited to, Montana, Florida, Texas, states where the governors have already come out very publicly and very loudly against this, this anticipated mandate. In the states where federal OSHA doesn't have jurisdiction, where there's instead a state plan, the state plan will have 30 days to adopt a rule that's similar to or more restrictive than the ETS that OSHA puts out. 
So their employers will have a little bit more time, assuming that the state plan ends up putting out a, a, a different rule that's similar or more restrictive. Between now and the promulgation of the ETS, there are a lot of questions that have to be answered. And with that, we'll go to the next slide, please. So this slide, it, a lot of text. I think I'm violating some presentation 101 uh, with, with this slide here. There's a lot here. You'll get the materials afterwards. But just wanted to, to point out, there are a lot of open questions about what this ETS is going to provide, most of which we have some tea leaves on, but no clear answers just yet. On the coverage topic, as Tracy mentioned, uh, the, the expectation, what, what, what's been announced so far is that 100 employees is going to be company-wide. Don't know yet what that might mean for a smaller employer where maybe joint employment arguments could be made that, hey, if you count you know, joint employees, the number might be higher. As Tracy mentioned, for remote workers, uh, the expectation is that the ETS won't apply to workers who are fully remote. But for employees who might come into a work site or who might, who might work around others, then the application would, would be expected. The application of the ETS would be expected. In terms of vaccination, you know, one question is, what proof must employers obtain? It's not clear yet if vaccination cards versus just attestation is, is, is uh, going to be enough or what's going to be required. Uh, there's an expectation that pay time off will be required for vaccination, both with respect to the injections and any side effects that an employee might, might uh, experience. But the particulars of how that PTO will work aren't quite clear yet. Weekly testing, uh, so we know that's going to be part of it. We, we know that, that according to the announcement that, that, that President Biden made uh, just a week ago now, um, the expectation is that employees who aren't vaccinated will be expected to uh, test weekly. But what tests qualify, we don't know yet. Uh, the healthcare ETS required PCR testing. It's worth noting that President Biden and his broader plan that he announced last week uh, noted rapid tests that are available from Amazon, Kroger, and Target. Whether that means that rapid tests will satisfy the weekly testing requirement, not quite clear just yet. Um, a lot of employers have asked, a lot of clients have asked, who's going to have to pay for the testing for employees who aren't vaccinated? Also not clear yet. Um, under the healthcare ETS, uh, screening tests that, that were required for employees were the cost of an employer, but we don't know yet if that's going to be the same for this broader ETS. In terms of enforcement, one thing I'd note, in addition to what, what's mentioned here, one big question is how does OSHA enforce this? You know, OSHA has about 800 safety and compliance inspectors. How do they enforce this across 100,000 or, or more private sector employers who are infected by the new rule is, is a big mystery at this point. Aside from the questions about the ETS's exact contours, there's also questions about whether it will be challenged. Um, and we'll go to the next slide for that. So unlike the questions on the previous slide, this one has a pretty clear answer. The ETS is going to be challenged. In fact, it's already being challenged in Arizona. Um, and there's reason to expect that a lot more is to come. Uh, to give you a glimpse of that, uh, we could uh, as most lawyers know, so when you think about what's authoritative, what's binding, you look at statutes and regulations and case law, but a new form of guidance that tells us a lot is Twitter. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, and I'll just show you a couple examples. Um, so we've got here, or not here, but, but just north in Tennessee, uh, the governor came out the, the day that, that uh, President Biden made his announcement saying, we're not going to stand for this. Uh, next slide, please. We'll go in pretty rapid succession here. Same thing in South Carolina, same day. Uh, next slide. South Dakota, and we can just keep going uh, slide by slide here. Next slide, please. And we'll stop with um, we'll go to uh, stop with Texas is fine. Actually, one more. There we go. So on this one, uh, this is exactly the kind of big government overreach we've tried so hard to prevent in Arizona. Worth noting, and I'll talk about this in a second. Arizona became the first state to actually file a lawsuit challenging the Biden administration's authority to pursue this ETS. Uh, next slide, please. Right there, it's just a little, little bit of a lag. So we've got a lot of states here. Actually, can we go back one? I'm sorry. So we've got a smattering of states here 
where we've got governors coming out very publicly, very quickly saying, we're not going to stand for this. This is just a smattering of the opposition that we expect the ETS to face. Um, just yesterday, attorney generals from about two dozen states, including the states that are listed here, joined in the letter to President Biden challenging his authority to push for the promulgation of the ETS. And in that letter, the attorney generals previewed numerous arguments that we anticipate opponents of the vaccinate or test mandate will ultimately assert. So we're gonna talk next about, you know, how do we expect these challenges to pop up? Uh, and for that next slide, please. So the, generally speaking, the statute that allows the, the ETS to, 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 to be issued by OSHA um, also allows any person who's adversely impacted to petition a federal appellate court where they live or maintain their personal, or sorry, principal place of business to challenge an ETS. The filing of a petition doesn't automatically stay or enjoin the ETS, but a court that receives the petition could ultimately choose to do that. There have been nine ETSs issued uh, between the start of the 1970s and 1983 when there was an asbestos-related ETS. Of those nine, six were challenged. Five of those six challenges were successful to at least some extent. Obviously, those were different times than now, but it just gives you an idea that challenges do happen and they can be successful. If multiple petitions are filed, what, what is supposed to happen at that point is they would be consolidated in a single appellate court. Um, but it's possible that, that a given appellate court could stay the ETS before that consolidation happens. So that's really a wait and see at this point. In addition to the ability of somebody who's adversely impacted by the ETS to file a petition in a federal appellate court challenging it, we're also seeing, as you saw in the slides before this, the state attorney generals and the state governors who are lining up to a challenge or lining up to, to, to threaten a challenge. They could pursue this appellate filing route that I just mentioned. I don't know how standing would work in that circumstance. I think some governors um, could, could have standing or some state AGs could have standing to, to pursue that avenue and some might not. But even if not, as, as we've seen in Arizona, and I'll talk about this in a second, there could be other avenues outside of the, uh, the, the appellate route to assert a challenge. How the challenges will come about is one thing. I think the, the, the other question is, well, you know, what exactly are they going to argue? What, 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 what are they going to try to demonstrate? So with that, we'll go to the next slide. So one challenge that, that you can absolutely expect to, to transpire here is going to center around whether there's, in fact, a grave danger to workers and also whether the vaccinate or test mandate is a necessity to protect workers. Again, the whole premise of an ETS is that there's a grave danger to workers and that the, the standard that's announced, the standard that's promulgated, is necessary to protect workers from that grave danger. Certainly, you'd expect the administration, when it faces this challenge, to argue that amidst the rise of, of the Delta variant, um, you know, th th there's absolutely a grave danger, that the country's seen this huge surge in daily infections, a lot more hospitalizations than this time last year, and more deaths than this time last year as well. Opponents, on the other hand, we've already started hearing and seeing, will argue that there's no grave danger, that the vaccinate or test mandate, even if there is a danger, isn't necessary to protect workers. Um, I mentioned uh, just a moment ago that about two dozen state attorney generals joined in sending a letter to the administration challenging its authority to move forward with this ETS. I think it's helpful to, to look at some of the arguments that they assert there as arguments that could be asserted once the ETS is issued. Regarding grave danger, the attorney generals in that letter said that uh, that employees in general are not at grave risk, and they focused on arguments about natural immunity and also relative lower risk among, among young people who don't have comor uh, comorbidities. Um, regarding necessity, the attorney generals also took issue with that. They said that, look, you know, there are other less restrictive, less intrusive means to protect workers than a vaccinate or test weekly mandate. Opponents may also point out that the administration earlier this year and, and, and over the last year was reluctant to extend this type of emergency rulemaking beyond the healthcare industry um, and how that, how that will play out remains to be seen. 
Another avenue that's been talked about a little bit is a non-delegation challenge. All I'll say on that one is that a lot of folks are familiar with the fact that the CDC's eviction moratorium was upended by the Supreme Court earlier this year. That was based on a non-delegation challenge, and a lot of individuals have questioned, could there be a similar type of challenge to OSHA's ability to issue this type of broad mandate across private employers? Regardless of all of this, the vaccinate or test requirement promulgated through an ETS seems to be a question of when, not if. The ETS is going to come, it's going to be challenged, but nevertheless, it's, it's going to be issued. Even though it's been successfully challenged in the past, employers, in my view, should not be banking on an enacted standard being stalled or terminated by the courts. They should instead plan on what to do if this thing ends up coming down the pipe. Employers that have already mandated vaccination or vaccination or test policies should be relatively well positioned to, to respond once the ETS comes about. Employers with 100 or more employees who haven't started down that path certainly should start thinking about it and, and moving down that path promptly. So on that note, I wanted to turn it over to Kristen to talk about considerations in evaluating and ultimately implementing a vaccination policy. Thanks very much, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, and, and I know that, you know, for, for all of you listening in, um, what you need to do first is orient yourself as to who you, who you are here. You know, are you, are you an employer worried only about the ETS? Are you um, a federal contractor who may need to worry about, um, you know, vaccination in lieu of testing, meaning not allowing testing to remain a part of your um, already issued policy? You know, if you're a healthcare provider um, or a nursing home, for example, you've, you've, you've been down this path, you've had requirements for mandatory vaccines either issued by CMS for nursing homes or in the healthcare context more broadly by state law, you know, so you're, you may be well down the path of having implemented a mandatory vaccine policy. Um, but, but even so, you likely want to take another look at that. Uh, policy and, and make sure that you understand how it might be modified by the executive order um, that would apply to you if you're a federal contractor uh, and to potentially the, the OSHA ETS if you're a large, large employer. Um, certainly, if you haven't started, as Kevin mentioned, we encourage you to, to act now. You know, we, we do think this, this train is coming and it is wise to prepare. Uh, and we've, because we've seen a very successful programs rolled out in uh, industries such as healthcare, we, we kind of know the playbook and, and know how, how this rolls. Um, but certainly, you know, large employers who, who now can choose not to allow for testing other than as a reasonable accommodation for a legitimate exemption on medical or religious grounds, um, that may, you know, to the extent that you now are, are moving away from testing as an alternative, uh, that certainly could represent a change for your policy and, and will be worth um, re-looking at, at your um, ground rules. Um, for those who are government contractors, we do anticipate that that's likely to land like the federal worker, you know, no test mandate. Uh, and so if, you, uh, if that represents a change from your policy as a federal government contractor, um, also worth looking back at that. And then, you know, as an OSHA um, ETS uh, subject, you know, for large employers who uh, are going to be subject to that OSHA ETS, albeit perhaps challenged, to the extent that you had um, rules that, that were different for hybrid uh, employees who uh, were coming into the office, you know, you'll recognize now that OSHA is going to expect those people to be vaccinated um, or tested on a weekly basis. And so again, another reason to, to relook at what the ground rules were that you set prior to the issuance of this executive order and um, prior to the OSHA ETS that we expect um, to be better defined uh, shortly. Next slide, please. We'll talk a bit about um, the, the policy considerations that we think uh, you should be focused on. You know, in our view and our experience, a strong statement from, you know, the leader of the organization uh, is helpful to set the tone here, and that tone may have changed. It's, it's, we recognize that previously, if you've already implemented a policy, perhaps you've relied on, you know, a cultural mission, a, a, a desire for safety in, in patient care, for example, and now perhaps you'll lean a bit more on the fact that this is now a government mandate. Uh, we certainly think a strong statement, well articulated, will avoid a lot of questions. And so there's, there's value in making your statement um, um, you know, resonant and, and clear. 
Um, that said, you know, if you, if you decide to lean very heavily on the fact that you're now subject to a government mandate, whether as a large employer or as a federal government contractor, you know, plan for what will happen if the ETS is challenged and what will you say then and what will you then require? Um, so again, a, a reason to focus on your, the clarity of your message. And also, although we think a strong statement helps to avoid a lot of random questions, we also think it's important to provide a path for employees to pose those questions, a point spokespeople who you entrust with the answers, and really establish guidelines for how the policy is going to roll out, you know, guidelines for how you're going to review accommodations, which Kobe's going to touch upon in a few minutes, uh, but also FAQs for employees to better understand why now, for whom, by when, all of those important questions. Also, we want you to prepare for public relations fallout. I mean, we understand, as Kevin just articulated, um, we should be anticipating resistance. We understand there is a lot of resistance out there to the uh, vaccinate or test uh, and vaccinate only kind of mandates that are, that are now, um, you know, part of our lives. We expect that there will be, you know, continued, some folks find these offensive and controversial, and you need to be prepared to deal with those employees among your workforce. Um, Think about uh, also, you know, the, the deadlines for all of this, you know, set clear, clear goals for yourself uh, about how you're going to handle accommodation, the accommodation process, establish a clear timeline, um, set deadlines after which a case will be considered closed, and make sure you're setting criteria also for um, the review of those accommodations to be handled carefully um, and robustly and consistently, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about some tips and tricks along those lines. Uh, make sure when you're asking people for follow-up um, to engage in that interactive process, um, you're setting deadlines for that and you're clearly articulating what's expected and why. Um, next slide, please. As you, uh, you know, look back at your policies, figure out, again, you know, who you're going to be covering by your, your vaccinate or test mandates. For government contractors, you know, you're, you're going to be expected to um, focus on workers who are not only working in connection with a particular contract, um, but also uh, an individual working in connection with a federal contract-like instrument. And that is going to be true whether they're in a federal facility or not. And so your policy may have uh, been more focused on the four corners of the building. Um, the executive order is gonna require federal contractors to uh, look more broadly than that. And as large employers, um, you know, what roles, if you're going to allow for testing outside the context of a reasonable accommodation, for which roles will you allow that to happen? Um, and, you know, if you're allowing testing for some but not others by role or region, uh, be mindful of the fact that a disparate impact claim could be alleged when you're drawing distinctions between employee populations. So note that the EEOC has stated that a vaccine mandate may expose an employer to allegations that there's been a disparate impact on a particular um, race, color, religion, or sex, or that a person in one of those protected classes has been wrongfully excluded from the workforce in some capacity. So depending on the demographics at your sites and in the regions in which you're gonna have to roll out um, these programs, you know, take care to focus closely on that issue. Of course, employers can defend disparate impact claims by establishing that the mandate uh, or testing is job related and consistent with business necessity, uh, but, but you know, be prepared to make those arguments. And likewise, you know, talking about the consequences of, you know, in lieu of vaccination, you know, what happens next? Uh, be prepared if you're gonna be a large employer requiring people to return to the office and therefore vaccinate you know, be prepared to articulate why that was okay during the pandemic as a temporary condition, but now is no longer an option and, and vaccination uh, or weekly testing is required. Uh, next slide, please. Speaking of, of testing, you know, there's a real question for employers now um, who are able to, you know, are not subject to a mandate that um, forbids them to allow testing as an alternative, the question really becomes um, for large employers with over 100 employees, will testing be an option? Or is testing going to land um, only as a legitimate accommodation, uh, an accommodation for a legitimate medical or disability uh, exemption? Um, if you are permitted as a large employer to make testing an alternative that folks might choose in lieu of the vaccine, keep in mind the ramifications of that 
um, decision. They'll have to take into account where the testing will occur, when it will happen, on shift or not, on site or not, and who will pay for that testing if it is simply an employee's choice to avoid a vaccine um, in the, you know, for the employers for whom that remains a, an option. Um, hopefully, as Kevin pointed out, the ETS will go into some detail and address not only the paid leave portion that we know OSHA is, has been charged um, with, with outlining for employers that time spent vaccinating uh, and recovering from any symptoms of the vaccine must be paid. We're hoping the OSHA ETS also will, be, will shed some light on this compensability question for testing. Um, those questions obviously are nuanced and challenging for employers uh, now and impacted by whether testing is simply an accommodation for a legitimate medical or religious um, exemption request, which the presumption should be paid for by employer, as Kevin pointed out, and as is evidenced in the healthcare ETS that we are already uh, familiar with. Uh, but in other circumstances, you know, those compensability questions are also impacted by prior DOL guidance, which suggests employer payments for medical screenings, medical attention on site, uh, and some, um, some uh, medical, specific medical testing, um, also influenced by state law. So, it, so the jurisdiction in which you sit may, may also matter for compatibility questions. Hoping that the ETS provides, um, sheds some light there, provides more guidance. Um, and, you know, we also are, are becoming aware that there are now supply chain challenges, supply chain challenges. So if you're a large employer who has the option to provide for testing in lieu of vaccines, um, keep in mind that, you know, lots of folks are thinking about those things right now and we are, we are hearing um, and are well aware of some challenges putting hands on tests right now. So um, with that, I mean, we understand that many of you are challenged or in the midst of um, challenging accommodation processes or are preparing for how you will set your workflow and criteria for granting or denying those requests. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kobe, who's going to walk us through some considerations. Thank you, Kristen. So um, the big question for on the minds of many of you, as I'm even seeing coming through the Q&A, is how are we going to deal with all of this for the people that can't or, or won't be vaccinated because of an accommodations-related issue? Can we go to the next slide, please? There's a couple of big questions. First of all, I'm going to just very briefly go over the types of accommodation requests that you might see. And then we need to talk about the various things that you're going to need to do as an organization, including deciding your organizational approach to how you're going to deal with exemption requests, setting up your system for how to intake and deal with those, and then preparing for the consequences of your decision related to the various exemption requests that you might receive. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we have two main types of exemption requests that must be granted. Um, well, I shouldn't say must be granted, that must at least be considered. So the first category is going to be medical and disability related exemption requests, and the second category is going to be religious exemption requests. You're also going to see what I refer to as like the other exemptions. Those are going to be things that are personal in nature, politically based, secular. You're going to see a lot of conspiracy theories, anti-establishment type of objections to receiving vaccinations. Um, while you, if, if you're not covered by a mandate, you may be allowed to um, allow people to be exempt from vaccination requirements for such reasons. But if you are covered by either some of the federal mandates or certainly some of the states, like in California and New York, you won't be allowed to let people be exempt from the vaccination and testing requirements on those basis. So um, let's start with the medical and disability related exemption requests. Those are going to be covered by um, both state and federal laws like the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, Title VII, and then associated state laws um, in some of the bigger states, certainly like California and New York. Um, those govern protections for employees um, based on disability and or medical conditions, including things like pregnancy. Um, medical conditions could even be as broad as uh, allergies to the vaccine, which you may see. Um, so if you have medical or disability related accommodations requests, employers are required to give reasonable accommodations absent undue hardship. Um, the undue hardship standard under the ADA and under most of its state law equivalents is pretty high. So you have to be able to show that there is um, like a relatively extreme burden on the employer 
or um, or that a reasonable accommodation cannot or does not exist for allowing or to in order to exempt somebody from the vaccination or to not exempt somebody from the vaccination requirement. Um, generally speaking, um, it is not considered to be a reasonable accommodation to exclude people from the work workplace um, if they have a medical or disability or religious related accommodation request um, absent some kind of direct threat or an inability to give a reasonable accommodation. Similar to the medical and disability related exemption requests, um, you are going to see probably a lot of religious exemption requests. Um, and Title VII and its various state law analogs protect employees who have sincerely held religious beliefs, practices, or observances um, that prevent them from taking a vaccine. This is actually very, even though the wording is not that broad, the case law, both on the state level and federally, is interpreted quite broadly and also tends to encompass morally or ethically held beliefs that take the same sort of role as religion for most people. So it's a very broad reading of the term religion. Um, so it covers more than just your traditional religion. Like you don't have to say I'm Catholic or I'm Muslim or something like that. Um, but here the burden on the employers who are granting or considering exemption requests is not as high as it is under the medical and disability prong for exemptions. Um, it just has to be more than a de minimis cost on the federal level. You're going to want to check depending on the states that you're located in, you may be subject to that higher standard like you are for the medical and disability thing. Like in California, the standard is a lot higher. Um, in terms of the medical and disability related requests, the ones that are recognized by the CDC are actually quite minimal and they are basically allergic reactions to vaccines. Um, the CDC doesn't recognize virtually any other reasons for which you would have a medical or disability related requests that should be granted, that doesn't mean that you won't see them. And generally speaking, we don't advise that employers are in the ability of, or are in the business of second guessing medical judgment if a doctor has given your employee a reasonable, uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but generally you shouldn't be second guessing employees doctor's notes. Um, and then in terms of the religion ones, we'll talk a little bit more about this as well, but employers are seeing a very large number of religious related exemption requests, um, simply because these are a little bit more fuzzy and um, the case law on these uh, is relatively undeveloped to this point, certainly in the context of the pandemic. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So the first big picture question for you is to think about your organizational approach. And one of the things you wanna think about here and this has been a big issue for many employers, is what have you done historically? So frankly, many companies historically have accepted exemption requests at face value. So if you've gotten in the past, you know, employee requests not to work on Sunday because they observe the Sabbath, or you've gotten employee requests for prayer breaks, or you've gotten employee requests for frequent breaks to, let's say, like do insulin injections because they have a disability, um, employers really, generally speaking, have not pushed back on those. So for many employers, this is the first time in which they're really seriously having to consider whether or not and how much they're going to be pushing back on employee exemption requests from employer policies. Um, and so some companies are taking the same approach that they always have, which is if somebody presents something that looks reasonably credible on its face, they're accepting it. We sort of call this the path of least resistance. It's easier for your HR and legal departments. But you also got to consider the potential downside, which is that if you're doing that, you may get a lot, a lot of exemption requests. Um, you know, we have some companies that we're working with that have, you know, in excess of 10,000 exemption requests. Um, and I have, you know, some other companies that I'm working with that even though they're relatively small, are getting several hundred exemption requests, both medical and religious in nature. And so if you are accepting the exemption requests at face value, your employee population will know and understand this and they'll tell each other. And so people that may have been on the fence about whether or not to comply with your vaccination mandate may just feel like it's not that big of a deal for them to put in an exemption request and then they're going to do that. So that's something to consider if you're talking about how you're going to approach the exemption requests. So then what we would call the sort of middle ground is requiring backup support for exemption requests. So normally 
um, if an employee submits a request for either a medical or religious exemption, what you might want to do is ask them to submit some additional information. You can't require that they submit any particular type of form. So for instance, you can't require that they submit a clergy letter, which is something that people commonly do. You can ask them to do that. You can ask them to submit additional documentation to support their exemption request, um, but there's nothing that you can firmly require or say we're not gonna grant it. So what most employers are doing here is asking for some array of materials. So whether that's a, a letter from someone's religious leader or someone that can attest to their reasonable religious beliefs, asking for a note from someone's doctor, um, supporting a medical exemption request, asking people to answer a handful of questions about whether or not you know this is a sincere a sincere issue. Um, and those can be done either verbally or in writing. Uh, frequently, um, if things are very fishy, um, a verbal a verbal interaction with the employee can be best because if you submit questions to them in writing, um, employers are in mass getting lots of copied letters from the internet about why people can or cannot be vac or why people cannot be vaccinated. So sometimes verbal requests can be more efficient in this regard because employees are sort of forced to think on their feet. Um, and then the Third ground, which I would call the the scrutinized position, which is for if your organization has taken the approach that you want as many people as possible to comply with your vaccination mandate and you feel strongly about this. Now, this we're seeing this a lot more in certain types of industries, for instance, those in healthcare or those that are in healthcare or medical, I would say adjacent industries. Um, so, for example, where we have clients that manufacture medical devices and things like that, and they feel like they have a strong mission. You know, we also have some companies that we work with that are, for instance, um, you know, doing testing on things related to cancer and other types of illnesses. And so they feel very strongly that they're pro-vaccination. They're taking a very strong approach on scrutinizing exemption requests. And this may be the first time that the company has done something like this. And so they should understand that if there is a challenge to the way that they've approached this, that that's not without risk, um, because the person may say that they're being specifically targeted related to you know, their religious beliefs when the company hasn't historically done this. So companies that are doing this know that there is some measure of risk in it, but that is um, you know, the, the risk tolerance that they've taken. So here, you want to make sure that you're going to involve your HR and legal teams if you're scrutinizing the exemption request. This typically involves both asking for a written follow up and doing verbal questioning and or written questioning of the employees. Um, and especially where there's some kind of evidence that there may be some falsity to the request. For instance, if you have um, people that are you know, submitting things from doctors or churches that are out of state, um, the employee has, you know, bandied about the workforce talking about how they're anti-vax and the government can't do this to me, um, that sort of thing. Your organization may want to be taking a stricter approach with this. There are some things to consider. So, for instance, if you have a very large volume of requests, um, a company that's going to take um, a company that's going to have over 10,000 exemption requests may feel very differently than a company that's going to have 10. You know, if you only get 10 exemption requests, maybe you do just accept them at face value. But if, you know, 10% of your 100,000 person workforce asks for exemption requests, maybe you want to be a bit more circumspect with it. Um, I also mentioned you're going to want to consider your company's mission or ethos in terms of how you decide to approach these. And then you also may want to consider, frankly, like if you get this many exemption requests, can you in fact accommodate these people and is accommodating them easy because if accommodating them is difficult and you need them on site, then perhaps you can't have as many of these people granted exemptions as you might otherwise consider. And then um, other considerations are staffing concerns. So if you're pretty hardline and you're concerned about losing employees um, or losing critical staffing volume, that may frankly affect how strongly you want to address the exemption requests. And then also employee relations is another issue that you're going to want to consider as you decide which of these approaches to take because um, if you expect employee walkouts and things like that, you know, that may affect whether whether and how strict you want to be considering these exemption requests. Um, and on to the next slide, please. 
All right, and then so once you've decided what your organizational approach is going to be, you need to set up the system for how you're going to deal with the exemption requests. Um, most companies are setting up some kind of form, whether that's um, digitally or on paper, about how employees can submit exemption requests, um, and you need to decide who's, who they're going to go to, and who, whether you're going, who you're going to designate as the personnel or team to review the exemption requests. Again, this may be affected by the volume of requests that you're going to going to be receiving. Um, for clients that are receiving hundreds or thousands of exemption requests, they've set up um, teams or they've enlisted third parties like, like SciFarth or um, some of their typical third party providers to help them deal with the intake of the exemption requests. Um, then you're gonna need to talk about how you're going to evaluate them. Under both the religious and disability and medical related accommodations requests, you are legally required to have an individualized assessment and interactive process related to someone's exemption, exemption request. However, um, while it's ideal that you could just call or speak with everyone that has an exemption request, that may not be possible. If you're facing hundreds or thousands of exemption requests and you have a relatively lean organization. So if you have a large volume, what some companies are doing is they're looking at sort of a bucketing system, if you will. So if there is, let's say, objective evidence of insincerity on the face of the request, um, which could be the request itself, you know, uh, has some kind of conspiracy theory associated with it. It's clearly not religious or medical in nature. It's clearly copied from the Internet. We're seeing a lot of those. Um, that goes into one bucket and then you have like the questionable bucket that requires further follow up and then you have the ones that seem objectively sincere on their face and you approach how you deal with the different buckets differently. Um, and, um, and then depending on how you do that and you can frankly, you could use a sort of bucketing system, if you will, even with a smaller amount of requests, but the same sort of concept and then from there you're going to need to look and see if it looks as if there's sufficient information provided or you have follow-up needed meaning that you may need you may want to request information from a clergy member or a doctor um, and then once you have made these sort of initial decisions about what to do you may strongly want to consider a second level review of rejections because if someone were to come against the company later and sue saying that they were discriminated against for their religious or religious request or disability related request, it's helpful to have a second set of eyes and make sure someone's not getting, you know, too aggressive with rejecting an otherwise potentially facially valid exemption request. And then um, last but not least, you want to be able to communicate. So you need to clearly communicate, ideally in writing, the decision whether or not the exemption request is granted or rejected or what we call the third possibility of defer, meaning that if someone's exemption request is granted, tell them, yes, it's granted and this is going to be your accommodation. If it's rejected, we recommend saying why. And that may be that this is rejected because when we spoke to you on the phone, you said that you are making this request because the government doesn't get to control your body and that's clearly not a religious exemption request or we're rejecting this because you said that you have, need a medical exemption but your doctor's note specifically says they told you to get vaccinated which actually happened to me yesterday with a client um and then the third bucket is what we call the defer bucket and these we do have some clients doing this where they don't want to make the hard call about whether or not someone's medical or religious exemption request is valid. Now, query whether this may be allowed under some of the state or federal mandates, but in some of these instances, what we have clients doing is saying that, by your request, you haven't given us enough information to sufficiently evaluate whether or not a medical or a religious exemption is appropriate here. However, given the nature of your job, we are going to grant your requested accommodation for now, and we will revisit this down the road as needed. So that's where we have um, some of that changing. And then um, moving on to the last slide. And I wanted to give the CLE real quick also before I forget. The CLE code is SS for Seifarth Shaw 8299. Again, that's SS for Seifarth Shaw 
Okay, so once you have decided where you are going to grant a request for accommodation, we need to talk about how you're going to implement them and what's going to be required. Now, the requirements are going to change depending on your local jurisdictions. Some cities, counties, and states have very strict requirements and some have none, depending on where you're located. Um, but primarily, if you're gonna be implementing these kind of policies, the most frequent accommodations are going to either be masking, frequent testing, which is gonna be required under a number of the mandates, um, potentially putting people in closed offices or installing safety partitions, social distancing in the workplace, potentially remote work. So if someone can't be vaccinated and or tested, you may want to keep them remote um, or modified shifts or reassignment to limit interaction with others. Now, both of these last two are going to be, they're kind of questionable. Can you force someone into remote work or modified shifts or reassignment? Generally speaking, that's not a reasonable accommodation. You can't isolate someone based on their religious or disability status, but if it is an employee's request that that is their reasonable accommodation or it's the suggestion of their doctor, that generally speaking would be okay. It's just not going to be something that generally speaking you're allowed to force as a reasonable accommodation. So those are going to be some of the main considerations. Um, and also you want to keep in mind that if you have a, an employee that's pregnant that has a, a, a medical related request that the EEOC says pregnancy and religious related accommodations should be considered similarly. So you have to be able to consider both sets of accommodations for those folks. Um, and then the options where no reasonable accommodations may exist potentially could be temporary job alteration, meaning that someone has to be assigned to do something differently, um, leave of absence or termination. And then once you make that decision, you have to be you know, ready to stick with it. And that's the harder thing for many of them, many employers as they're facing these really tough calls with how they're going to be accommodating their workforce. And I'm sorry, I realized that we've gotten like almost up to the hour. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, open it back up. I know that we have a bunch of questions and we've been trying to answer them as we've gone along. We're going to try and answer some of them again um, in writing once this is over, but um, I'm going to open it up to my colleagues if there's some you wanted to do verbally that you saw a bunch coming through. And I think Kevin and Kristen, you're still on mute if you're trying to. All right. Oh. Kristen, did you want to go ahead? So I saw a couple of questions, you know, relating to the issue of who pays for the testing. You know, that is going to depend. I know it's a big issue that folks would like a clear answer to. Certainly, if it's a reasonable accommodation, um, so you've granted an exemption for medical or religious reasons, um, we recommend payment for those tests because the risk is that you would be um, potentially subject to an allegation that you were treating people discriminating or retaliating against people based on their religious or disability status. Otherwise, um, you know, the, the notion of who pays for testing, we hope will be um, illuminated in the OSHA ETS um, for large employers. Um, and it will be influenced by things like prior guidance from DOL um, relating to screening, testing, and medical um, assistance on site at workplaces and state law. So, so stay tuned for more guidance as we get more guidance on that. One of the other questions I saw um, related to the notion of bargaining, and certainly to the extent that one of these federal mandates applies to you, uh, it, it, it may take it out of um, a, a true collective bargaining um, setting for you, although the effects of your policy may still be a subject that your union will expect you to, to bargain over. So contact your labor relations um, council to discuss how this might affect your, your, your need for bargaining and, and your bargaining over um, the effects in the workplace uh, in particular. Um, anyone else wanna take a shot at some of the questions that are coming in? So there was a question about tracking vaccination status and how to do that. I think, you know, one of the things you have to remember is these are confidential medical records. They need to be treated as such, which means that you can't put this in the personnel file or a common file. These have to be in confidential medical files or other separate files. We have many clients who use their HRIS systems, for example, to collect this information and they need to be um, properly accounted for in those systems and with very limited access given to those. So just wanted to give you that call out. We are at the top of the hour now. Um, 
thank you all so, so much. As Kobe said, we will do our best to get you written responses. We tried to respond to as many questions as we could as the program went through. We really appreciate all of your feedback and participation and stay tuned for future webinars. As I said, this is going to be the first of many because this will continue to evolve and we're happy to partner with you throughout this process. Bye everyone.